this television series is a series for youth and um, the, the, the entire series is based on um, the imagined events of two Clinket warriors along the northwest coast. And um, the reason I made this series is because of my interest in um, Clinket oral culture. And uh, I had had the privilege of studying some Clinket stories. And once you begin to study the stories, you find certain themes emerging constantly, themes about uh, resilience, themes about, uh, themes about survival, uh, very important tales. And so I began to understand that these stories were obviously the vehicle for very important education for, for Clinket youth. And when I read the stories, I found them a little bit difficult to understand. I found the language a little bit obscure. Of course, they were all secondary sources. These were people who had worked with Clinket elders along the coast and recorded the stories. And because of their integrity as scholars, the stories were presented in the way that the elders told them the stories. And so thankfully, and, and I'm very grateful for this, the scholars, and you know them all, Emmons and uh, uh, the work of De Laguna, all of those, those wonderful scholars on the coast were very consistent with how they recorded the elders' stories. And when I read about their scholarship and how they would insist on, um, on checking and rechecking and it, trying to ensure that the stories were very accurate in the Clinket way, I began to understand that what I was reading was really the uh, uh, genuine texts. And now I, I do understand that there have been, from time to time, some small issues. With, uh, uh, with some of the facts in the stories. However, overall, the body of work was, was uh, significant and important and really reflected uh, the culture as it was heard at that time. Now, with differences in languages, of course, because I was reading in English, um, my understanding was that there were many um, instances of uh, uh, liberties, well, liberties is probably you know too too broad, but there were certain changes made by the people recording because some of the the uh, Clinket elders changed the words themselves because there were certain things that they didn't wish to be broad knowledge by anybody, and so there were certain parts of it that were um, that they withheld. Nevertheless. Uh, the texts that I read were, um, I was able to base some of the stories on the things that they said. When I wrote the stories, I tried to remain really true to the spirit of the stories so that I would not deliberately distort them or, or make them too sort of Disney. Um, uh, however, there were certain aspects of it that I did have to explain it in a different kind of way. And when we think about the origins of European uh, fairy tales, if you look at the original origins of the European fairy tales, uh, particularly the German ones, you will find, if you read the, the original texts, that these stories were much different. They were not uh, for modern consumption. Um, as, uh, for example, the story of, um, of uh, Snow White, for instance. Um, in Snow White, in the original story, what happens after Snow White wakes up is that they force the two ugly stepsisters to wear red-hot boots and dance themselves to death. And of course, this was for a modern audience, telling your children this story at night was not what uh, was wanted. And so now she gets a sweet kiss from the prince and that's it, they live happily ever after. And so uh, I must say there is an element 
of, of um, these, these sorts of things that did happen in these stories. But they are only one aspect. This is only one representation of those stories. And it is for youth, and so these stories have been adapted by me. Um, uh, we have the privilege today of having two of the actors that were in this series in the audience, and I would ask uh, Dwayne uh, Gaston to, to uh, stand up. He was one of the actors, and I chose this episode because Dwayne's in it. And we have another one, and that is Elaine Shorty, or um, Jackie Shorty, how could I? Uh, Jackie Shorty, another actor in the series, and I believe you're in this episode as well. So we'll go ahead and watch it. I really wanted to, as well, show you part of the Clinkett version because we have, we have a number of accomplished um, Clinkett speakers in our community who assisted greatly in uh, adapting, in, in translating this into the Clinkett language. And so that version is available. Unfortunately, we could not find, we couldn't find the menu on here and I had somebody try to come and help and we still uh, can't access the Clunkett version. Um, I do have a couple of copies for sale. There's only three left now, but the, the, there's a Clunkett version, a French version, and uh, an English version. So we'll go ahead and watch it now. I believe we have enough time to watch the, the whole episode, and uh, I'd be very grateful for your questions and your comments following the screening. Okay. This technique is called live action animation, and that's why they sort of look like real people, but there's an animated layer put on top of them. And um, it's, not, it's becoming a common technique now. When we made this five years ago, it was, it was a very new technique. And um, it allows you to treat the entire film almost like a little bit like a storybook. And that was the effect that I wanted, was to enhance the reality and to also place the people, because I wasn't shooting on the coast. I was shooting, this is all done in studio. Every bit of it is in studio. So when you see uh, scenes of forests and rivers and trees, we created all of that in the studio, all through computers. And uh, we had quite a team of people working on this in order to create the, the right effect. And it took months and months and months because every frame, every single frame in some instances had to be painted. And so we put the painted effect on. And while in some instances it lays over completely, in some instances we needed to do it almost frame by frame. And uh, then, of course, um, uh, all of the sounds as well are put on later. The sounds of the river, the sounds of splashing, the sounds of running, the sounds of breathing. Everything is put in later on. So when we do the original film, we shoot in a studio that was about twice this size in order that we could get people running and things like that. So when you see Anish running through the forest, in fact, he's running on a treadmill, and he's on a treadmill, and behind him is nothing but green, uh, just a green painted screen. And so he interacts with that screen. And so in another episode where we have, uh, we have him running through the forest, he's running away from uh, uh, a, another group of warriors, he reaches up and he uh, re pushes a branch aside. A branch hits him in the face. Well, the branch was up on a stand right in the studio, clamped on there. And so I clamped a uh, branch on so he could run between them so that it appears that he's running through a forest. So absolutely everything was put in later. Even if they're drinking from something, very often there was nothing there and they would have to hold uh, a cup or a vessel or something like this and uh, pretend that it was there and pretend that, that they were drinking from it. And then later on, through our various computer systems, then we put the objects in. So it was actually quite an enormous exercise uh, to do these kinds of special effects as opposed to just shooting a straightforward film. 
but um, it was worth it for us. I did have a little trouble finding a producer because you always need a producer. They're the ones on a film like this that help you find the funding and help you with all of the, the logistics of making a film like this. And um, when I finally found somebody who was willing to go on this journey with me, it was really a great thing because I was almost thinking I may not be able to do this or I may have to go full, what's called full animation. You'll see the difference in the story of the salmon boy, the boy who went to live with salmon, who, which is, um, as, as probably most of you know here, is a traditional and very important uh, Clinket story about how people learned to respect salmon, how not to disparage them, how not to ever say negative things about salmon or, or uh, consistent with never saying anything negative about any kind of wildlife at all, but to ensure that, um, that the holistic uh, uh, kind of respect was kept. And so it was very important for me to tell that story uh, for one thing, it's a story that children do tend to really like and they're able to relate to it very well. And um, so with some of the other, every episode has, uh, and that's called 2D animation, the w where the, the, the salmon story. So every episode has 2D, a 2D am animation story in it in order to emphasize that these were vessels of education that, uh, that uh, as you see, Anish realized after the elder told him the story about uh, the boy who went to live with salmon, then he realized later on, oh, okay, it's important that I bring knowledge back to my people. And that was why he agrees then to become the deer hostage. And uh, the whole concept of the deer hostage, by the way, is, um, is embedded in, in, thank you, in, um, in Clinket culture. And uh, that, is, that is the way that they would do it. They would take a captive and that captive would stay in the enemy's longhouse in order to ceremonially have that um, have uh, the people be able to make peace with each other. Uh, as you know, there were many wars among different nations. And so um, this, they would help each other find peace in certain kinds of ways. And um, how, they, uh, how, how they often did it, as you know, is, to, is reci reciprocity, where if somebody of high status was killed, then uh, very often they had to find somebody of um, the other tribes who was also of high status, whose life would be then taken in reciprocity for the one who, who was killed. And it was that kind of um, the, the, the basis of the, the really strong basis of the Clinket justice system in these, in these sort of days. Um, uh, another thing about the series is that um, uh, once it was completed, we um, had many screenings. There's, it was on a few networks in Canada and, um, and in the U.S. as well. I'm not, I don't think it came here because other people have told me that they haven't been able to see it in, um, uh, over in this area. But um, there are opportunities for other networks to pick it up, and I'm hoping that uh, at least a local one will. There is, as I mentioned before, there is a Clinket version, and people in my community were very involved in, uh, in creating that and ensuring that there is uh, some opportunity for education and, um, and use in, uh, uh, in, in Clinket language circles. So, um, we were uh, fortunate, we, uh, we have a, an accompanying website with a lot of the image, images on the website. We uh, were fortunate to win the Japan Prize, a very, very good international prize. And we also won another international prize at the Banff uh, World Television Festival for Best Youth Series and a few other awards in Canada as well. And uh, we had a lot of remarks on the the appearance of it, because it was different. It's, it's, it is a, a, a totally different look for, for this kind of production. So 
Uh, yes, Erica? And that is the version for people who can't see. But, oh, okay. but because of our technical problems here, we could not find the menu. And because I wanted to show part of it in Clinkit as not well. Not no, it is not. That's for people who can't see. And I really apologize for that. But um, Alice, I got Alice to come in because some other people couldn't find it either. And uh, even Alice, she couldn't find it either because I wanted to show. Yeah, so I couldn't find the Clinkit version, and I'm really disappointed with that because I really it was very important to me to come over here and uh, to be able to show that we did it in Clinkit. And uh, that, that, was, that part was very challenging too. And so the interpreters in Taslin tried their very, very best, but it was a very long and difficult process for them because the concepts were, of course, quite different from the original uh, Clinkit concepts. But they did a heroic job. No, not at all. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. Yes. I would very much like to. I would like to continue the story. I would like to see the. Uh, I would like to see uh, Anish become an older person, and the handover of um, Alaska, and to under because the stories about when the change took place are so powerful, so enormous, and um, this story ends when Anish finds his home. And uh, he is, the, 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 there's a guy, we don't see the other guy, but it's about two, gu two warriors. And the other warrior that is with him is in a time of transition. He was one of, he was a family slave actually. But I wanted to illustrate how slaves could improve their lot through action how they could uh, sometimes become free. I know I'm not trying to make it all, you know, like it was all nice and everything, but I, there, there were instances when people like that could improve their lot. And so at the entire end of the series, his friend that he always travels with, um, d he ends up doing something extremely heroic. And so he is elevated to a position of a warrior. And so that is the, the, the kind of happy ending for the entire series. But um, I think that it, right now it is very, very challenging to do that because as we get into more modern times, I believe to be fair and to, be, uh, to do well by Clinkett history, that it has to be very exacting. It has to be very cautious. And, but some of the stories, as, you, as everybody here knows, really, really powerful about when that, the change took place, about when the Russians left and how things changed. It's, it's always so phenomenal for me how life changed completely um, due to, uh, you know, due to um, uh, the events in, that were happening in Russia, the, um, all the difficulties there that were coming at that time. And of course, much more later on in, you know, the time of the, the Russian Revolution. But even at this time, earlier, there were many, many changes that were taking place as to why Russia, um, you know, um, how, why the Americans got to purchase Russia for, you know, a really, a real bargain basement price and things like that. And of course, the Clinkett people were not involved in that at all. In fact, there's an account of people, of uh, Clinkett people during the handover, during the, the, all the important signing of the documents that um, whereby Russia was, was giving up um, Alaska, um, there, there, there's an account of some Clinkett warriors who paddled up in their canoes and watched from a distance, watched this, these events on the shore. And it always, um, it just made me so sad to think about uh, those Clinkett people sitting there in their canoes and watching from the water, watching their land, their home, getting passed over by a mere signature. And they didn't understand it. They were really confused. How can this be happening? This is meant to be our land. 
but they had absolutely no power at that time, as you know. And so they simply watched it from their canoes and they watched really their lives uh, change enormously um, at that signing because uh, I, you know, can't, can't go into, I mean, it's, and, and also my, my knowledge is so limited, but um, the, 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 the way life was before and after was really, really different and very powerfully different for the Clinket people. So I would like to have a hand in telling some of that story for youth because, um, as you know, most uh, culture that youth are absorbing is modern culture, is, is um, modern Euro-Canadian, Euro-American culture and they don't hear these stories. They, don't, they aren't taking any lessons from their past because they aren't hearing the stories and they, they often, very often don't know the stories. I had somebody in Whitehorse tell me that they were very keen on hearing the stories about their past and they would go to events where elders were going to tell a story, but the elders, being very traditional, would tell the story in such a way that uh, youth have a very hard time absorbing it because they don't have the context. We adults can listen to an elder tell a story and we can be patient and we can try and decipher it and then we can, we can understand uh, the lesson that, that is, is implicit in the story. But for youth, they have a really hard time understanding it. But when you are able to translate the stories in this way, at least they get the context of the stories. And I'm very gratified that I've had, uh, I had one student at UBC who is taking these stories and writing about these stories um, in order to talk about how youth can possibly have more access, more knowledge of the kinds of events that took place. And as I say, I really emphasize that this is only one, uh, one medium. And so we must have all of those stories in their, right from their very original forms, all, the entire spectrum from song to written word to films like this, to perhaps more authentic um, texts that people can, so people can compare all of them. Because it is, you know, it's like everything. If you, if you watch uh, Ken Burns' uh, series on the Civil War, uh, then you can go to other texts and you can find out more about certain aspects of the Civil War but you don't take Ken Burns' documentary as the definitive way that it was. You take it as just part of your whole body of knowledge. And so uh, this always concerns me very much because I am not, I want to always emphasize that I'm not representing myself as, uh, as an authority of this kind of knowledge. This is only my my interpretation, my story, and it will take other people. So I hope that this is um, going to be used in schools so people can add on to it. People can uh, sometimes say this is, um, you know, you're, you represented this in a shallow way or whatever, which is fine because as I say, it is only one part. It is only one interpretation. Yes. Thank you so much. That is exactly um, the kind of thing that I wanted to do was only pr only provide that one that one thread supplemented by real no by the real elder knowledge and from the text as well because my understanding was that the people who who wrote down all those very very important things were well respected by their informants and that um, uh, they, all, uh, they, they all were very careful and precise. And we're really fortunate in this part of the world and in the Yukon that we have had people who were so dedicated to getting it right that there's many sources and so we can compare all of those so that it's not just one source. So many First Nations and Nor Native Americans have many, have uh, just one source. Uh, I know there are places in the US where they had one person visit who wrote things down, and so that has become their sacred text, 
which is really unfortunate because now we don't know. We have no basis for comparison for that. Yes. Skookum Jim saw the, uh, a frog, and the frog was uh, called Wealth Woman, and uh, representing wealth. And so he knew somehow that wealth was coming. He wasn't sure how. But you're right, that, that is uh, to take a very specific event like that and have that different kind of interpretation. Because Skookum Jim himself could not, uh, he wasn't legally allowed to put a claim in for the gold that he found. And that was why he had to have his white brother-in-law do it. And so therefore he was, uh, you know, a little bit lost in history for a while, for a while. And that's a story that is never really being told yet in the Yukon. So I'm very interested in the Skookum Jim story as well. So, yes? Well, that, that can be used in that way. Um, there are 13 stories and I showed one today. Uh, the first story, somebody mentioned uh, previously, about, you know, it'd be difficult to show the illnesses or something. But in fact, the very first story is about how smallpox hits the coast and Anish loses his mother and his father. Uh, he comes back to the village from deer hunting and finds his village infected with smallpox. Yes, and how the villages were absolutely decimated by the all the, the terrible, terrible illnesses that came. And then uh, what, one really fascinating thing I learned was that the Russians were very wise about alcohol use. And so they, they governed it very, very carefully. And then later though, it was more wide open. And so the indigenous people did not really, it was so uh, present and not regulated anymore, not governed anymore, that then uh, many more illnesses came, many more addictions came. I have two comments here. Go ahead, Norma. You know, there has not been curriculum developed around it yet at all. Um, this, th a student at UBC thought that, um, you know, he was like, he's talking about things, but I, I don't really know because that's his, his work. But no, there has not been uh, a curriculum developed. But I'm, I'm hoping that um, by just the way it is in some ways, that it will still be able to be used in the school actively because of the Clinkett version especially. And uh, so uh, t a teacher can always pause on something and say, okay, what, what, uh, what do you think of the garments that they're wearing here? Or why do they not wear shoes? Why do they not wear moccasins like other First Nations people or something? And um, that way a teacher can then explain, well, this is the coast where, you know, they would be foolish to wear moccasins when they're jumping in and out of canoes all the time and that kind of thing. So they were barefoot all the time, all winter they were barefoot. And so uh, I'm hoping that they will be able to simply pause and be able to take the lessons from there. But a real curriculum has not been developed, it's true, and it needs to be. But when, you, when we create a television series, you're, you have to create something in order to satisfy the funders so that they know that you know, that you have some understanding of the world that you're talking about we have to create something called the Bible, and it's called the, the series Bible. And what the series Bible is, is uh, quite a lot of written materials that I had to write about the world of the Clinket. And it's not, um, it's not a scholarly work, it's not in depth, it's not, um, it's not something that you could really use on a higher scholarly level, but it is adequate, I believe, for, for uh, young kids. And for, so I think it would do in that way. And I've had it um, looked at to ensure that there are at least very limited errors in it in terms of my understanding. Because uh, as I say, I, I, I did have the opportunity of going to all the original texts. Um, not all of them, but quite a number from Alaska and got a lot of materials from over here and visited the museum many, many times and, um, you know, was able to, um, as you'll see from the, the clan crests, I didn't want to appropriate anybody else's. I mean, I can't, you know, it'd be really wrong for me to go ahead and use uh, Ishketan or something anytime I wanted or, you know, to... Uh, 
uh, to be careless that way. And so they're all kind of generic. You, if you look at them really carefully, you would go, hey, wait a minute, this doesn't look like a real crest. And it isn't, deliberately, it is not a real crest, except for some uh, 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 Dachau I felt a little bit more liberty to use, a little bit more Dachau And so all the longhouses, you would think that everything, the whole world is Dachau <laughs> because I didn't want to sort of step on toes and I had to be very careful about appropriating somebody else's uh, uh, clan crest or story or song or anything. And so when we do have songs in here too, in the, in the whole series, they're sort of generic, they're, they sort of seem like sort of a general clinket feel mm -hmm. as opposed to a specific one because of course that would be, I mean, this is something that uh, we're taught in our village very strictly, is that you don't go ahead and do anything that uh, would be, you know, offensive to another clan, like take their, anything of theirs, you know? And so um, I tried to be cautious about that in making it sort of more a generic thing. And um, yes. Well, it's actually not me, it's an industry term. They, they all call it that, all the big networks in the US, they all, it's all called the series Bible. And I think what they mean is that it's just, um, it, 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 it's some writing that you do in order to talk about the world of the series. So yeah, I, I don't know why they call it that, but that's that is seems to be just an industry kind of thing that they so they do. No, it's it's an industry term, so it's any series. So if you even in Breaking Bad, somebody would have written a series Bible in order to talk about the whole world of Breaking Bad, about Albuquerque and what the environment is like, how the desert is there, and how that um, people don't go out in the desert in the high noon, you know, those kinds of things. And that would be the series Bible. Because sometimes on a series you have different writers. Like normally on a 13 part series, you would employ different writers. I wanted to write it all myself, and so it did take a bit longer, but I did write it all uh, myself. But is that series Bible that for other television series, for almost anything, they, uh, the, the new writer would first of all read the series Bible to find out what the world was like, to find out that nobody goes out in the noonday sun in Albuquerque because it's, you know, the desert is very hot or something. And so they, that informs them then how to write their particular script. They wouldn't have somebody running out to the desert in, in, in the noon sun um, unless they really wanted it in their script, like to show somebody was foolish or something like that. But that's what the series Bible is. It just gives you information about the general world so that you know how to um, do your setup in the story and how to write your story. Yeah, so, yes. It is so important because they had, uh, they had brew, they had home brew, but they were very, uh, they were cautious about it. They made it themselves, they made it, but they, they didn't, it didn't become, they, they were not addicted to it. They would use it once in a while and they would, you know, maybe have some fun or whatever. But they really believed that you were not to go absolutely, you know, crazy on this because you, you the terrible, yeah, terrible things could happen and all of that. They used it quite respectfully. And before, uh, before the Americans took over, there were people running up the coast with boats full of alcohol to sell illegally. And so they sold that to some Clinkett people. And there were some Clinkett people complicit in that as well. Yeah, like everything else, yeah. And so they were uh, beginning to resell the alcohol that the Americans had brought up. But uh, no, it was, it, you didn't see people, apparently you did not see people. Exactly, I agree with that. I did a lot of, uh, I did research on, uh, on sexual abuse because I was very interested in traditionally 
um, how what were their prevention methods because I would hear elders saying that didn't happen before so I was very very interested in what form uh, the education took and what, what, what did prevent it? Well, I learned two really, really significant things. One was that um, I kept having elders saying, well, we watched the girls, we watched the girls, and we made sure they didn't go about any way they wanted, and they didn't go here, and there were no such things as sleepovers and everything, and so we really watched them. So I thought that was a bit unfortunate because it's all about control then. It's all about controlling the girls to make sure that they didn't go about. And the other one was a story that took place on the Northwest Coast about a man who was found to be sexually abusing children, and so the entire village was lined up on kind of a bluff over the beach while he was tied to stakes that were put in with the tidal area and he was tied there until the tide came in and drowned him and that was a lesson for the entire community about what happens to somebody like that but th those are the only two extremes things that I knew yes thank you so much everybody